Book of Aggie list. Well, how, how does this thing get started? Well, for years, I've looked at lists uh, in George Session Perry, I think his name was, History of uh, A&M. Uh, I've looked in uh, John Adams' several books. I've looked in... <clears throat> Speak up, sir. Oh, I thought he was coming after me for something. <laughs> I wouldn't have done that. <laughs> but, uh, <clears throat> you know, there were so many books, so many lists here and there, and if you dig into it, this list and that list of the same subject, but you got different people on it, you know. So uh, I felt that somebody ought to get together, get all of these lists, verify them, and then publish them for, for the general public. And uh, so I took this idea to my coffee group, and I had a number of uh, lists that I thought should be in the book, and they bought off on it. So I assigned everybody a, a list or two or three, and we started to work. Now, actually, you're talking about thousands of hours of research that was done just to publish this book. But some of the lists, you know, like, I know there were times when I would spend the entire day on one name, trying to get, get the thing right. But so uh, we, uh, we finally got it all done. We looked at the uh, core center was great help, former students some help. Uh, we looked in the long, old Longhorn annuals. We looked in the Aggieland annuals. And uh, we just pressed on. and. Uh, some of the people working on a list, they say, well, I've got another idea of a list. So we wound up with about 60 lists. And I thought, well, well, we'll call this the Book of Aggie List. I did not realize that there were all kinds of books of this, books of that. And I thought, you know, this was a unique name, Book of Aggie List. And Jerry Cooper came in and said, let me show you this. I've got a book of so-and-so. So I went on... Um, one of these websites where you buy used books and found out there were any number of books the title book of. So I wasn't original, but, but you know, I gave it my best effort. <clears throat> and there was, like I said, there were mistakes between lists. For example, per, uh, Bennett Purrier, class of 06, was listed in the core center as an Army General, Brigadier General. Uh, it was, he was listed in the former students directory, list of general officers, as a U.S. Army General. Well, it turns out the guy was in the Marine Corps. So, <laughs> you know, I was almost in the Marine Corps. I went down, I, I was about 15 years old, World War II, and I went down and, you know, said, I want to be a Marine. And you know, they just kind of laughed and gave me some brochures and told me to come back when I was 17. So I came close to being a Marine anyway. <clears throat> now the first war that the Aggies participated in was the Spanish-American War. And uh, we developed a list. And now when you talk about a list, list should be at least, we'll give you a number, but it's at least because we're still finding names. Just uh, uh, last week, someone came up with the name of the, the missing uh, fish drill team commander for 1955. We didn't, that was one we couldn't find. Well, we found that out last week. So <clears throat> after the Spanish-American War, I didn't give you the number in there. It, it, you know, it'd help if you could see. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, there were about 96 uh, Aggies identified. Now, he is not an Aggie. <laughs> now, now, he may be a tea sipper, but he's, <laughs> but he's not an Aggie. Anyway, in 1916, Pancho Villa that was involved in a revolution started in 1910 in Mexico, and they were operating along the 
northern Mexican border, and they were slipping across into uh, forays into uh, U.S. territory. They uh, had a big attack on Columbus, uh, New Mexico. So he was one bad hombre. Well, the Americans decide we'll do something about it. The problem was that at that time, the American Army was a little over 100,000 soldiers. We were, I think we were 16th or 17th in the world in size of our military. Romania was, had a larger army than we did. So it was necessary to call up the National Guard. And I read uh, a few years ago where 40, uh, yeah, 47 states sent troops. We had 48 states then, if you didn't know. But uh, 47 states sent uh, National Guard so, uh, soldiers down to the border. And we, you know, we never did catch him. General Pershing had a, the punitive expedition into northern Mexico, but we never caught the guy. He was one tough dude, I think. All right, this is the, uh, the World War II memorial. Uh, I mean, World War I. Thank you, Jerry. I only missed it one, one more. <laughs> <clears throat> World War I monument. It used to be over on Simpson Drill Field, and they, the last few years they moved it over near the core in the, what's called the core plaza. The conventional wisdom was always 55 Aggies died in World War I. We got 55 flags around Kyle Field. We got 55 oak trees around the drill field. Well, a group in, uh, in uh, Brazos County, you know, I think it was the World War I commemorative group or something, I'm not sure of the name, they came up with eight more names. So we added those eight to our 55. And the last I heard, the list is up to 70 now. So uh, I think we're gonna have to buy a few more flags for Kyle Field. Okay, this is a, a World War I uh, tombstone or cross in the Blue Woods, Argonne Forest in, in France. Now, the, we have 11 Aggies that died in World War I and were buried in over, um, overseas cemeteries. And we have in the book the list of overseas cemeteries for World War I and World War II. And actually, I've been to several of them, and they are the the most well-kept places you'll ever see. I mean, they are just completely, deco not decorated, but maintained. It's, it's remarkable how, how the job they've done. And the 104 Aggies from World War II have been identified as being buried in these overseas cemeteries. Now, we got all this information from Dr. David Chapman, who some of you know, who had this as a personal project for years, several years, and uh, he he was the one that did the list for us. And, and uh, when researching all this, I ran across something I thought was very interesting, and that was at the end of the war, the people that were buried overseas. Now this this was for both World War One and World War Two. The family was asked, "Do you want?" To, your, your loved one to be buried in an American cemetery overseas, or do you want your loved one to return home? Of course, most wanted them to return home. But they also said this decision is irrevocable. Once you make the decision, that's it. And you can understand why. During World War II, we had, uh, uh, you know, a tremendous loss of uh, wounded and injured and so forth. They were shipped back to the States and they were met at the port with what was called a, a hospital train. These hospital trains took them, the, the uh, injured soldiers to various military hospitals all over the country. Well, at the end of the war, uh, we no longer, longer needed a hospital train, so they converted the hospital trains into funeral trains. And the same, same procedure, the, the remains of the, uh, of the, the fallen would return to the states, placed on a funeral train, train, 
and they were dispatched to one of 12 quartermaster depots around the country. And from the quartermaster depot, they were sent by hearse to, the, to their final place of burial. Uh, this is <clears throat> Tom Dooley. He was with General Moore on Corregidor when General Moore told him, I want to know how many Aggies are on Corregidor. So he made a list, made a list, and he identified 26 people on Corregidor, not, not counting Moore, who was an Aggie. He identified these, and this, was, this became known as the muster, uh, the Corregidor muster of 19, was it 42, Jerry? 1942. Uh, it, they didn't all gather together because they were under fire and they couldn't afford to leave their defensive positions. But it became very famous as the Corregidor Muster. Now there was a Corregidor Muster 1946, uh, attended by by a uh, hundred or more. How many, Jerry? Hundred or more? Is that close? Okay. And uh, <clears throat> that's the picture you see on the cover of the uh, of of our book. What was this last year, do you know? Yeah, I do know. Uh, but, but I'm going to have to find it. <laughs> <laughs> what was it, Jerry? You know. <laughs> you got about 35 or 36. 35. 35. 35. 35. Yeah. Can we take that to the bank? No. Okay. 35 or. <laughs> Plus or minus. Yeah, yeah, later in 1934, okay. Well, he's in class 35 then. Yes, he's held yet head yell here. Well, early 1942. Most of you were around at that time. May remember that those were bad times. The Japanese had taken Wake Island and Guam, uh, invaded the Philippines. They were taking Indonesia, and uh, over in the Atlantic, uh, the Germans were had taken France, so, so those were dark days. And America needed a hero, America needed a victory. And that was provided by Jimmy Doolittle. You may have heard of him, the, the Doolittle Raiders. Now this picture shows uh, Madame Chiang Kai-shek on the left, uh, then Jimmy Doolittle, and then there's old John Hilger, class of 32. He was Doolittle's deputy and he was on the mission. Actually, there were five Aggies in the Doolittle, Doolittle Raider organization, but only four flew the mission. But they, they provided heroes for the American citizens and a feeling of victory, finally. Now, this is Lewis Job, 52. He's on the list of approximately 95 fallen comrades of World War II. Actually, he was in my outfit. He was killed in North Korea in uh, 1953, and his remains were never recovered. We have a list of all the fallen comrades of, uh, of the Korean War. This is a picture of a guy I really admire, and that's not MacArthur, but the other guy is uh, Ray Murray. He was a Marine, and his, his career read like the history of the Marine Corps. He was in China, he was a China Marine before, the war, before World War II. He went with the, with the Marine Brigade to Iceland in 1940. He was in the, down in Pusan perimeter, he led the charge in Inchon, the amphibious assault in Inchon, and he was up in Chosen, and uh, and that's all. In, all uh, <clears throat> he uh, he was awarded two Navy Crosses and one Army Distinguished Service Cross, and four Silver Stars. So he's a fantastic guy. I I've been trying for several years to talk to some Marine local Marines about getting a committee to get a statue of him. Like I said, I'm not a, I'm not a Marine, even though I tried to join when I was 15. But anyway, um, I think the guy deserved a statue in the quad. Uh, but I haven't gotten anywhere on that, that project. 
anyway, this, this picture shows uh, MacArthur uh, uh, with him at the uh, Inchon Landing. Now, we've got a list in the book of all the Aggies that were decorated during the Korean War. Uh, some of you may know this gentleman, uh, Alton Meyer, class of uh, 60, and with him is John Blevins, class of 61. He was one of, uh, this is when he was returning from the POW, uh, camp in uh, North Vietnam. Uh, we, in, our, in our book, we have a list of four Aggies that were POWs in, in, world, in uh, Vietnam. And also, there's another list of 22 Aggies that were missing in action, and the remains of 12 were, were recovered, and I think since then we've recovered one more. And you know, the, this recovery is still going on. Uh, we, we can't do it in North Korea, but we're doing it in other places around the world. I was in Germany a few years ago in the Hertgen Forest, and uh, just the week before they had found that this is in the 1990s, I guess, they had just found these two, uh, two American soldiers. Now this gentleman, Condon Taylor, class of 56, we believe he was the first Aggie killed in Vietnam. Uh, we have a list of our fallen comrades for Vietnam in the book. It contains 203 uh, three Aggies. So if, uh, you know, if you're an Aggie and you were, you were in the Corps, well, the, these lists are extremely uh, interesting. I quick question. I thought Bob Johnson was the first Aggie killed in Vietnam. Well, I, he that's was in my class. first, well, he, first, first I've heard that. Off getting off of a helicopter or something like that. I don't know, but our research okay. tells us that he was the first one killed. Now, to research the, the Vietnam casualties, there's a uh, website called COVID. COVID, uh, I don't know the, the exact name for that, but the COVID list of uh, Vietnam casualties, and it was extremely helpful in our, uh, in our research. And you know, sometimes uh, the, uh, look at these lists, it gets a little emotional. For example, I had a classmate at the infantry school. He wasn't a class A and M classmate. He was class of '55, uh, but he was a classmate at the infantry school, at Fort Benning. And I had word that he had been killed in a mid-air helicopter crash in An Khe, Camp Radcliffe, Vietnam. And I was working on the list. I went down. We were doing it by class. I went down and found that there was a guy in the class of '52 was also killed in a mid-air helicopter crash. Same date, same place. So evidently, two helicopters crashed. One, two Aggies crashed. So uh, that was kind of emotional. <clears throat> this is uh, Meredith. Howard, class of 76, is the only female that we've had that was killed in, in the service. And she was killed in, uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, we have a list containing 39 people who died in the global war on terrorism. Uh, four of those were civilians. Two in 9-11 uh, and two were killed in Vietnam. This is Major Richard Poling, class of 69. Uh, you may know his son, who is here in town, who is a doctor, Scott and White, Matt Poling. Richard Poling was one of two people awarded the, Armed For uh, the Air Force uh, Cross. That's a relatively new medal for the, for the services. But uh, <clears throat> we have the list in the book. We have the list of Air Force Cross winners. We have the list of Navy Cross, Distinguished and Distinguished Service Cross. Each one has a list. 
This is Jay Robbins, class of 40. <clears throat> He's on our list of Aggie aces. He shot down 22 enemy aircraft. There are 12 Aggies on this list. And we also have a list in there of airfields and air bases named after Aggies. For example, Bergstrom, Carswell, and Easterwood. And there, I think we have about seven, seven uh, on that list. Now, some of you may recognize that fellow. That's General Armand, Armand Simpson. My wife said he was the most princely man, most gentlemanly man she had ever met. And he was a Marine. I mean, can you imagine? <laughs> can you imagine that, you know? So anyway, um, we have a list of the general officers for all, all services, There's a list for each service. I like this guy, yeah. Next, uh, next Pancho Villa, is, this is my favorite. Anyway, this is uh, Victor Baracco. He was the head, class of 15, he was head Yale leader. Uh, he was also a Marine. But we have var various lists that has head Yale leader, corps commander, RV commander, Reveille handler, head drum major, commandants, Parsons Mountain Cav commander, fish drill team commander. So there are a number, number of books like that, I mean a list like that. I understand that Aggie Ring today cost you about 11, 10, 000, uh, 1,000 or 1,100. Anybody know what it cost? Somewhere around $1,000. Well, they, they let you buy the ring for $1,000, but they don't tell you how to take care of it. You know, so what we've done, we came up with a list we call Aggie Ring Rules. Uh, if you'll follow this list, with your new ring, it will, in 50 or 60 years, it won't look like that, which is just a kind of a lump of gold. You can't even tell my class, or you can't even tell the name of the university I went to. But A&M has been very selective about their Aggie ring, very protective. Uh, and they, there is a system controlled by the uh, Association of Former Students where you don't just walk in and buy a ring. Now, some colleges, you can go down to the drag or the local, <laughs> you know, the local area and go to the jewelry shop and you can buy you a class ring. Well, not with Aggies. But anyway, we tell you in our book how to take care of your ring. And you know, uh, Aggies normally will wear their ring and this is kind of unusual for a university. Now, there are other universities that, that uh, the majority of graduates will wear the ring. CM, uh, VMI, the Citadel, the military academies, you'll find that they wear, wear their rings. So anyway, we're proud of that, but I wish I'd have known years ago how to, how to take care of my ring because it wouldn't be just a, a shiny glob of gold. Now, several lists we haven't mentioned, such as Aggie Mess Hall slang, Lost Aggie Yells, Aggies on Japanese Hell Ships, Aggies aboard the French Croix de Guerre in World War II, World War I. Now, we also have an appendix in there that explains how A&M became designated as, a, as the Military College of Texas. How many people in here knew that Texas A&M was officially the Military College of Texas. Let me see your hands. <clears throat> not many, not many. So anyway, it tells the procedure that they went through to get that. <clears throat> so these various lists uh, uh, give us a wonderful view of our military heritage. We're, we're proud of our military heritage. Now I've got some good news and I've got some bad news. The bad news is that McDonald's Senior Citizen's Coffee has gone up to 75 cents. Uh, <clears throat> I, I was shocked yesterday when I went in. Shocked, I tell you. 75 cents, I'd have brought my own. But anyway, 
but I've got some good news. <clears throat> I've got three books on sale. <laughs> I've got a good price. And, and senior citizens love discounts, you know. They really love discounts. Well, don't go to McDonald's if you, you know, just there. Uh, <clears throat> but anyway, we've got the Medal of Honor book, which is a paperback, which is $15. We've got the 12 Aggie War Heroes. Normally it's a $30 book, $25. We've also got this book. I didn't, uh, we've never been licked. The guy that was starred in that, Richard Quine, was re reportedly said this is the worst movie ever made. <laughs> But it's a good movie because you can see a lot of campus. It was filmed on the campus, so you can see a lot of uh, campus sites and inside the mess hall, inside the dormitory, and so forth. But anyway, let's get back to the good news. Uh, and the, the the book of Aggie List. Well, anyway, you know what the book looks like. <laughs> uh, it's uh, normally a $39.50 book. Today, for you only, $25. How about that? We take checks. We take cash. We take credit cards. We take pesos. <laughs> uh, euros. We do not take crypto coins. <laughs> so anyway, it's, it's an opportunity. If anybody wants me to sign it, I'll, uh, I'll sign it for you. No extra charge, okay? <laughs> so anyway, um, I appreciate you, the opportunity to tell you about our book, because we're, we're very proud of this book. We think this is a classic that will be around for years, and it will aid some people a lot of hours of research because we did the research to get this book in. And I'm, I'm proud of the book, and I'm thankful for all the people that contributed. Uh, I see General Darling's here. He contributed. Uh, Buck Henderson, John Adams, Jerry Cooper, all, all contributed to some lists. And we've got uh, and Lisa back there from the Core Center. <clears throat> she was a great help in, in putting a lot of this information together. And, especially helping with photos and so forth. And I'll tell you about the Corps Center. If you haven't been to the Corps Cadet Center on campus, you ought to go. It's free. Better than McDonald's. I mean, it's free. <laughs> but, uh, and it's open, normal do hours during the week, no charge. So uh, uh, you ought to, uh, I call it the jewel in the crown as far as a ms goes. The, Core Center is the jewel in the crown. But it's, it's a great, great place. So go visit there when you get a chance. And I thank you for your attention and for coming today. Thank you. Thank you.